Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, wherever you are uh, around the world. Uh, indeed, we are delighted to welcome you to the first mentoring webinar we are running at the African Academy of Sciences. We are glad that you could join us. Uh, here is Grace Moaura uh, from the African Academy of Sciences, and I coordinate the mentorship scheme as well as our affiliates and fellows of the African Academy of Sciences. We are a membership uh, organization where we recognize excellence of scientists from across Africa, as well as support uh, science programs and think tank work on science on the continent. So for the next one hour, we're going to listen to uh, Professor Chalfal, who's going to share with us on how we, we can set up and manage research labs. So I want to believe most of you are at that critical stage where maybe you have your, you have your first uh, research grant and you're moving on to have your own team or you're thinking about moving into that direction and you're looking into insights for doing that. Uh, Chalfal will be able to do that with you. But before that, I want to highlight a few things about this webinar. If you look to your right, you'll, be, you'll see several options available to you. You'll all remain muted for this session, so you'll not be able to ask questions verbally. However, you may be able to type them to us either as questions or as a chat message. And if you go there, you'll be able to type in and we'll be able to respond to your questions as they appear to us later on after Charles has given his talk. You may also raise your hand if you have any technical problems and we'll be able to address them to you. When you are uh, asking a question or, or wanting some clarification, you may be able to select whether you want that addressed by the organizer or the, uh, or the presenter. I would, I would um, suggest that you direct all your questions and, uh, and concerns to the organizer so that we can address them immediately. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to read a brief bio of Charles Fall. And after that, we are going to, to go right into the, into the webinar. I believe other people will be able to join us later on uh, because I see we have about half of the expected participants. So in just a few seconds, I'll read to you his bio, which maybe most of you have interacted with as well. Uh, so Chalfa is a professor of organic, uh, uh, of material chemistry and head of inorganic and materials chemistry at the School of Chemistry at University of Bristol. He has a PhD from Stellenbosch, uh, South Africa, and he got this in 2000. And after four years of being a postdoctoral researcher uh, and then a senior scientist at Max Planck Institute of Colloids and Interfaces, he moved to Bristol in 2005. He is currently a core principal investigator and a member of the management board of an EPSRC funded center for doctoral training at the Bristol Center for Functional Nanomaterials. Uh, Charles is also one of our mentors on the AAS mentorship scheme, and I'll be happy to talk about this later on. Currently, the, the early career researchers who are benefiting from our, men, from our mentorship scheme are those who are affiliated with us either as affiliates or grantees in the various postdoctoral fellowships that we have. Uh, I, may, I will direct you to the AES website later on where you can find out more information about these programs. What I want to do now is to welcome Chao Fao to make his presentation, which is going to last about 30 minutes. After that, we'll start responding to the questions that you may have, and those questions can be uh, directed through the chat box or the questions box to your right of the screen. Um, so, Chal, um, if you can hear me, I'm now going to share the screen with you for you to present. Great. So, um, thank you, Grace. Um, thank you very much for the, the, well, let's just switch on my screen. So, I hope all of you can see my shared screen now. So, it's great to take part in this first mentoring webinar. So, I'm very pleased and, yeah, very privileged to be part of that. So, um, Grace, thank you also for the introduction. So, as Grace said, my name is Shaw. So, I hail originally from South Africa and I've been yeah, first in Germany and now in the UK for almost the last 20 years. And so, it's really great to have the opportunity to share some of the experience I've gathered over the years with you. So, I can only encourage you to please uh, post your questions and Grace will then sift through those and then we'll try and answer as many of them after my presentation. So I'll launch straight in. And so you can see that um, I have added a kind of a secondary title there, 
say from PhD to PI, so from PhD student to principal investigator, and I think that is can be quite a daunting step. It's also very exciting, so I hope to share a little bit of some of my insight that I've gathered, some of my experience. Uh, sometimes I've earned that the hard way, and hope that you guys will all be able to benefit from this. So I'll just move straight on to the next slide. So a little bit about my background. So first of all, I did a master's degree in physical chemistry at the University of Bristol with a very strong industrial connections. And so after that, I decided to go on and do a PhD. Um, and my PhD, I started actually in Durban at the University of Kozulu Natal. Um, but after one year, my PhD was stopped due to some, let's say, funding issues. This was in the mid 90s in South Africa. And um, so basically, after almost a year, a year and three months, I had to look for another PhD position, another PhD project. And I was very pleased that I found uh, another opportunity back in Stellenbosch. So I started again with a PhD, um, in this time in the field of polymer chemistry, which I then kind of continued with. It was during this time that I also had the opportunity to spend some time in Germany um, as a PhD student, about two months a year, which then led to me going on to Germany, spending four years there before moving to Bristol. Um, you will also see that there's uh, just above the photos yeah, um, uh, a very important line. So I've been very fortunate to be married to Jacqueline, my wife, already since 1996. And so without her support over the years, uh, my career would have not been possible. And so I would like to also acknowledge the help that she's given over the years. And that's something I'll come back to later for all of you, because, of course, yeah, this is an important aspect of, let's say, normal life, even as scientists. So I've just put some photos down there. So um, you can see the ones on, on the right hand side. Yeah, you can, yeah, please no comments on how young I was. So these were the, the, the two photos on the right hand side are from my, my small research group I had in Germany. And then once I started to move to Bristol, you can see I started with three guys at the top left hand corner and my group grew. And at the moment I have, uh, I don't know, 24 people in my group. So why do I say this? Not to discourage you, but actually to encourage you to say that actually uh, all of us start small and we all have to start at a point. And so don't worry if things look small when you compare it to other people. Please don't do that because over time, I'm sure that your, your efforts will also produce fruit and that your groups will grow and your scientific endeavors will grow with that. Yeah. So I want to just go on to the next slide. So this is just for those who are kind of uh, a little bit of scientific background or credentials. So I've been working in the field of materials chemistry, three main areas over the last, um, well, 20 years or so. And if you want to, you're going to go and have a look at my website and see what papers we publish and where the areas we work in. But I have an active research group. I have administrative duties. Uh, I have a family life i have all the things which you guys struggle with so i just want to make clear that actually none of these things are alien to me um i hope and i'll be able to share some of the the things that i've gathered over the years and will hopefully make your journey a little bit smoother so um so the question so where where, where do you start so you might have just as grace said just got your first grant or you're just moving into a position of independence you're just finishing a postdoc and the question is, how do we start? Uh, how does this all fit together? And how do you make it work? And I've shown in the background there a picture of a deconstructed car, because when you look at all the bits and pieces, you think, how on earth will this thing ever run? And I think sometimes that's the feeling I had when I started. How do you get to kind of gather up all the bits and make this work? So to do that, I want to return formally to the topic of the day. And so this is the, the strap line that was in the advertisement that said, this webinar will help early career researchers to think and plan strategically, lead effectively while also ensuring a good work-life balance. Of course, I am not sure if I'll be able to answer all of those things and be able to give detailed guidance within a short period of time. But I think that the idea is to really look at some of the keywords which are uh, found in this. And I think, yeah, so firstly, Think and plan. So that is, I think, really important. And strategically is another important aspect of what we want 
to consider or think about today and effectively leading effectively and then the crucial work at the end, their work-life balance. So keeping those in mind, I want to go to the next slide. I want to think a little bit about when you start your group. So you have your money, first money, you're just applying, you've got maybe your first student or two or three. And I think it's really important to take a little bit of time just to identify the vision for your group and ask yourself, so what is the overall aim of my research? Um, what uh, is the purpose? What is the direction that I want to take? And also what are the objectives or the steps that I want to take to reach that overall aim? How am I going to get there? And where do I see myself maybe five years down the line? And once again, this is not ask so that you will have the answers, but I think it's good to reflect on these things on a regular basis. Even when you are really busy, it's just to take a bit of time out and just say, well, do I still align with the things that I set out to do? And if not, do I need to change my aim or do I need to change what I'm doing to fit with my original aim? And of course, with that, you start to have some, some students joining your group. And so if you look um, so at this three-circle model, which is a kind of a management model, which was developed by a, a British management consultant, John Adair, where at the top you have the kind of circle of achieving the task, but at the same time, equally important, you have on the one side building and maintaining your team, or also developing the individual, whether that's you as an individual or your students as individuals who form part of your team. I think it's really important to kind of keep those three kind of circles in mind as you kind of continue through your, your own career. Um, in the UK, there's a concordat to support career development of researchers, and you see the formal, the formal uh, definition that I've taken there, and kind of talking about principal investigator or group leader. So the principal investigator takes responsibility for the intellectual leadership of the research project, for the overall management of the research, and for the management and development of the research researchers, which is basically reflected in those this three circle model. So. You can think, okay, this is all good. I mean, there are lots of kind of talk here, but what are we going to do? So I've exchanged after my first visit to Nairobi in September last year, with emails with a few people I've met there. And so with their help, we kind of came up with a list of things, which I've kind of, in the meantime kind of added a few points to. But yeah, you could see some topics that I want to cover today. And as I said, it will be impossible to cover all of these in great detail. But I'll be running through some of these and trying just to highlight some things that I think are especially important at the start of a scientific career and just at this point where you start your own research group. So this could be from the practical side, setting up, managing, uh, thinking about resources, how you manage projects, collaboration, networking, communication, writing, good academic practice, supporting and, men supporting and mentoring your own students, and of course, also investing in yourself. I'm sure there will be many more, and I would be very happy if at the end of the session you guys can also suggest maybe some other topics that you would like to be covered maybe in future sessions, and I would be very happy to look at those and see how I can share some of my own experience on those topics as well. So let's think about the real practical side, setting up and building your first research group. Um, and I know you might already have your money, so well done in getting your first grants. Or you might be busy and in the process of, of finding that first grant, that first chunk of money to really get you going. Maybe you are in negotiations with the institution that you are moving to, maybe moving back to, to try and negotiate a, start, a startup package of some kind. But I think maybe more generally for physical scientists, and this of course could vary widely across the whole space, infrastructure is really important. So for me as a materials chemist, I need lab space. Yeah. So, and I think this is something to consider right from the start is to try and see what you can do and how you can negotiate and try and ensure that you have the correct physical infrastructure to start your independent research career. And I understand this might not be so easy. You might say, oh, I'm a junior scientist. I don't really have the ability to ask for much. But I would actually think that, or ask you to consider carefully, because if you don't ask at this stage, 
of your career, the question is when will you have the opportunity to ask? Maybe especially if you're coming in new, that is a good time to ask for infrastructure. And you should think, and this goes back to the planning and thinking, think to yourself, so where do I want my group to be maybe in three years time, in five years time? Roughly how many students, how many PhD students, how many master students, maybe some undergraduate students, maybe a postdoc or two, and try and plan for a specific group size, maybe say, in three years' time, I want to have five or six people, and then think about the lab space that you might need. And I would encourage you to be ambitious. So not be ambitious to the point where you might set yourself up for failure, say, I want to have 20 people in three years, but just to say, actually, I can see that I need enough, maybe fume hood space or bench space or lab space, even if it's shared, but so that I have the kind of potential to grow my group to what I want it to be like in two to three years. And I hope and trust that as you engage with those who help to allocate space, that they would respond positively to you being ambitious in growing your group. And of course, making a contribution to this scientific and academic life of your home institution. Um, with that, of course, goes equipment. It might be that you need very large pieces of kit which are already within your department. It might be that you need more smaller things which will be lab-based. But it might also be that there might be some real practical considerations. You might need some specific power supplies. You might need some very quiet space or specific extract or something like this. So think ahead and talk to those in charge and try and see what you would need in terms not only of the lab space but also the equipment that you would need. And then maybe you've got all those things lined up. And then the question is, how do you find hands in the lab? How do you get your lab growing? And of course, maybe you are still in a position where you are spending a significant time of your, of your chunk of your own time in the lab, which is great. But if you want to grow and you want to launch a full-blown research program, you might need more people. And this is always tricky, especially at the start. So. I can only share from some of the things that I've done. So I tried to get some summer students in, some undergraduate students, looking for master students, PhDs. Actually, I was not very picky at the start of my career. I was very keen to take people into my group and get them going and get them to help me to set my lab up and run things. And so this is one aspect which I'm sure will keep you busy. Well, of course, you also have to juggle, juggle other activities. It might be that your home institution is asking you to teach. And so, yeah, and this I know varies quite a bit from institution to institution. The positive aspect of teaching from early on in your career is that you'll have a profile. Students will know who you are. You'll have the opportunity to get some students to join your group because they will know that you've joined recently. But of course, you might have to negotiate here so that your teaching load is not too heavy at the start because you really want to focus also on getting your research going, which and I think this is a good argument to make, maybe in the long term will be very beneficial for your department if you become very successful in your research. And it's to find the balance between teaching and research. Of course, you have to be a good citizen as well. So it might be that you have to take on some roles in terms of administration, maybe looking after a course or looking after specific aspects, while at the same time, of course, continue your publication output. Um, and these are the things to juggle. Um, you see, right, the last point on my, 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 my PowerPoint there is, um, yeah, your family. And that's not because they are the least important at the bottom. That's just one other important aspect to keep in mind. And we all have different family arrangements, yeah. And it might be that, yeah, at the moment you are a little bit more free, or it might be that in your family you have some new commitments, maybe with a growing family, I don't know. But please consider this right from the start to see how you can make use of the, let's say, relative flexible working hours we have within the academic positions to also engage and support your family, whether that's your own or maybe a wider family. Um, think about the practical aspects of setting up your research group. I would encourage you to get a website going. Um, if you're not very good at uh, designing a website, there are lots of free websites out there, free templates, say for instance, WordPress, that you could use and you could use their free websites uh, set up to launch your own website, have a list of your publications, show photos of your group members. 
yeah, maybe you are a social media fundi, get your research group Twitter or Instagram account off the ground. Yeah, start being active, tagging the right people. And yeah, also, of course, have your official email. So I know that sometimes people have a kind of a personal Gmail or Hotmail Yahoo account as well as your university address. Um, I very often encourage people to rather just stick to the official address. It looks more official and it gives confidence that actually you are really with an academic institution. But sometimes it might be that people are not sure who this person is who's emailing them if it comes from a Gmail account and it doesn't come from an official account. Think about office space for not only for you, but potentially also for your students. If there is a bit of space, you can create a group office or at least a group space which belongs to you and your students. This is a great way to create a feeling of coherence for your students. And launch some social activities and create your own group culture. I mean, if you did a postdoc abroad and there were aspects of things in the group that you were in that you really enjoyed, import those. Yeah? Make it attractive for students to want to, group your, to join your group because they'll say, oh yeah, these guys are not only working hard and they've got an excellent science, they are also you are pleasant to be with. Yeah? And then very importantly, I would suggest that you keep uh, the senior people in your department in the loop. For instance, your head of department, go and see them on a regular basis, him or her, and say, this is what's been happening. This is where I'm going well. Just had this paper accepted for publication. Just had the student apply. Talk to them about the resources. And basically, make sure that you include them in your early journey as you set up your group. And this means that they'll be aware of what you are doing, but they also become aware of what your needs are. And in case it gets to the point where you need to ask for something specific, it won't come to them as a shock. Um, apologies. So um, please also make sure that you talk to somebody like Grace or maybe somebody in your department and try and find a mentor. And of course, conference is another way to scientifically report on your progress. But more about that and networking in the following slides. Yeah. So when you start your own group, you are faced with the dilemma. You have to find enough people, usually when you don't have money, or yeah, other way around, yeah, so that you, you might end up with um, funding, but you might not have enough people. And as scientists or as kind of people who lead research groups, we very often face this dilemma. Yeah? So you have people coming to you asking for a project. You might not have the money. A little bit later, you might have the money, but then the good students are not around. And I don't have a clear answer how to deal with that, except that, yeah, this is a constant juggle. And the only way to try and smooth that out is to plan ahead, be proactive in, in advertising when you have money. Um, and to always try and secure money for good people who come across your path. Yeah? And, but there's no easy answer to that. The other dilemma I see that people face more and more is where there are kind of sources of funding available, but it might be outside your own area of expertise or their own focus area. So people start to chase money and projects. And my concern there, or something to keep in mind, is how do you continue to build a distinct profile? You want people to say, oh, this new staff member is the person who does topic X or works in area Y. So if you dilute your efforts too quickly by chasing money and different projects, you might end up losing your distinct profile. But I also understand that you sometimes have to chase the money because you need the money to build your distinct profile. I want to just make you aware that this could be something that you have to carefully consider as you build your, your own profile. And then let's say you have a few people and you start to kind of have projects running. I've had this question many times, so how do you decide on projects? How do you kind of decide on how much overlap there should be? Because of course, masters or PhD students each need a distinct project. And this is something which I think you have to carefully consider. There might be a, a shared basis or a shared foundation, and then from there build into different directions. Or there might be a shared goal of making a specific, let's say, device, which everybody shares, but there might be different approaches. So, and I think this takes careful planning. And this is maybe where a mentor could be very helpful to help you to decide on how to arrange projects so that there's enough overlap so students can support each other in the lab 
but not too much overlap that they feel that they are competing each other. And of course, one way to deal with some of these issues is collaboration. And that might be a potential answer to some of these questions, but I'll speak about collaboration in a few slides as well. So I move on to the next slide. So of course, we end up becoming kind of bench side or bench scientists to become science managers. And I think, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I love managing my group. I love the people. I love the interactions. But I think it's up to you as a group leader, as an independent scientist, to establish the culture in your group. It might be that you want something very different from what is in your home department. So it might be that you want to establish something which is very collegiate, very supportive, helpful, kind, fair, maybe all the things that you had from maybe experiences in more than one research group in your past. Yeah. And actually, that's an amazing opportunity for you to establish what you want in your group. Yeah. I think it's important to not only establish a friendly collegiate environment, but also to hand out responsibility and delegate to your students um, so that they also learn to take responsibility. And of course, not everything falls on your shoulders. I would set academic standards or all standards actually very high. Why? I'll come back to that when we talk about students. But yeah, if we don't set high standards, we are not good examples for our students. And then we should not be surprised if they don't just come up with excellent standards by themselves. I think it's important that you monitor and maintain the performance in your group. Yeah, you share the overall aim and objectives or the research plan that you have also with your group members so that they know exactly where they fit in so that you can manage them and help to manage the output of their research project. Remember to review and reassess and adjust, adjust plans on a regular basis. And also methods, it might be that you see that the targets that you wanted to achieve might have to be adjusted. That is all part of managing your research group and the people and the resources that you have. And I think importantly, and we'll, I'll talk about that as well when you talk about your research group, look at and identify and address and meet the training needs. It might be that there are individuals that need specific help with specific aspects. It might be that the group as a whole needs some specific training needs. And provide feedback to your students so that they know what you think. Uh, and this might be very easy if your group is, only consists of two or three students. But once you get to a larger group, it might be that you have to become more organized and schedule meetings. And this is something that I want to mentioned specifically. So remember, when you think about the resources that you have, that time is your most precious resource. We have a finite number of hours and minutes in every day. Yeah. So manage your time. And as I say, maybe now it's easy. You have enough time to spend in the lab and talk to your students informally. But very soon, you might start teaching, or you have some administrative duty. You have to find more money. And juggling the people and the money might become more tricky. So. Make sure that you are very organized and use calendars and uh, get your students to get used to a rhythm where you interact with them and where you take time to manage the resources in your group proactively on a regular basis. Please take the time to talk to the people in your finance department or research and development offices. They might have different names in the institutions where you are. But I think it's important that you engage with these guys. They are there to help. And if you're not sure whether they can help you, ask for help. Go to them, say, I hope that you can help me. I have this issue. I'm not quite sure how to deal with it. What would you suggest? And I think if you approach your colleagues who are there to support research in the correct way, they can become an invaluable asset. It might be that you don't agree with the systems in place and with the administration that goes with that. But sometimes we have to deal with local issues in such a way that we can get the best out of that in the easiest and the straightforward and best possible way. And that might be by going visiting, talking face to face rather than doing things just by email or on the phone. Yeah. I mentioned space as a resource before. Yeah, this is, stays a constant issue. So keep that in mind as you see your group growing. So you manage that resource very carefully as well. And then I mentioned already. The art of delegation, there are pros and cons to that. Yeah? I think it's important to get your group and your students involved and give them responsibility for small tasks. Yeah? 
and that will free up some time for you. Of course, you might say, well, actually, that doesn't because I end up doing the jobs myself. It might be that you have to change your expectations. But if you manage your students as one of your resources, actually, they will benefit. And in the long run, you will benefit because we'll free up your time to also focus on other things. And finally, the thing that I started off on this slide by saying is be organized. What does that mean? Please, I would suggest that you get a calendar. If you say, I don't like calendars, get a paper diary. If you don't like paper diary, get an electronic calendar. Schedule some time in for all the things that you need to do. And even if you don't necessarily adhere to it on a regular basis, try and adjust it so that it becomes something sensible that you can work with. Why? Because once you start running multiple projects, you will see that you need to be organized. You might have to meet with your project team or your students on a regular basis. Please do that formally. Why? Because there's something in the diary. People will turn up for a formal meeting. They'll produce yeah, content, maybe PowerPoints or written reports, which will help you to keep track. Your students will know where they are. They will know what they need to do. And that means, of course, that the projects will progress. Yeah? There'll be clear guidance. There'll be regular meetings to provide the next steps, the steps forward. You can revisit the aims and objectives of your studies. And in that way, you have the ability to really ensure that you move your project forward. Because finally, if you have to take responsibility to that, people will look to you for guidance. And if you lead in a specific way with a clear kind of structure, that means that people will easily slot into that and know how and when and where and what to do they need to do to move the project forward. In addition, your students will generate digital content, whether it's PowerPoints or Word or maybe ChemDraw figures or figures that can be really useful for them when they have to write a thesis or for you when you have to write the final report. So therefore, it's crucial to make use. So in my group, we have a shared group calendar. My students have access to my work calendar. There are various kind of project-related software, project management, kind of storyboards, project boards, a wide range of things. Find something that will work for you so that you have the opportunity to manage your project as well as you can. So writing, of course, within such a short time, I cannot really um, talk about all the details of writing. A few practical pointers plan for writing, whether it's papers or grants, the next fellowship follow-on funding, put something in your diary so you know when the deadlines are, talk to your finance people well before the deadlines, make sure that you have a location where you can write. Might be that you want to write at home for a half a day a week. Maybe it's not sensible to write at home. Maybe you have to go to the office. Maybe you have to go in a bit earlier in the morning to have a quiet time to write. Yeah? Um, make sure that you create space to focus. And in that way that you will have the opportunity to really produce good output. Get colleagues to check your writing. Maybe if it's paper writing, get your collaborators to work with you. And yeah, so in that way, keep producing, whether it's grants, review papers, original research, yeah, make sure, or even public engagement, some popular science, something for a local newspaper or for the television station, I don't know. But make sure that you actually put time aside to focus on those things. You'll see I said under papers here, review papers with a note, get invited. Nothing stops you from when you are at a conference and there's an editor of a journal to approach them and say, I'm a new uh, early career researcher. Would you be interested in a review in this topic or this area? It might be that they say, oh, actually, we've got an emerging investigator issue coming up. Would you like to contribute something? But in that way, we have to be proactive in engaging with those. Uh, journal editors and ask them and the worst they can say is no but very often they say oh actually that would be really interesting how about this topic oh this is what you want to cover yes or and that way you make yourself known to them and you also raise your own profile um, with that of course goes good academic practice remember that you have valuable experience from your own PhD maybe your own postdoc this might be a mixture of local and international experience. So take that back into your own group. Apply and bring the things into your group that you think are, are important. Set high standards. There's nothing wrong with that. But I would always say be very careful how you bring best practice into your group. Make sure, of course, that you're adopted to the local conditions. You will know much better than I do what will work in your environment. 
but more importantly, help your students to be successful. If they are successful, this will reflect not only well on you, but of course, you have the opportunity to support them in their future careers. So help with training, support, teaching, provide regular feedback and make sure that you help them and help them to monitor their progress on a regular basis. So with that goes supporting and mentoring. Yeah, when you take on a student, you have a responsibility towards them. So I take that very seriously and I hope that you will too. So provide regular feedback and give praise where praise is due, but at the same time also give honest feedback if things are not going according to plan so that they know exactly where they stand. And this can be done through a formal monitoring progress in your institution or maybe monitoring in your own group. I think it's crucial that we are fair to our students, that we are kind. And I wrote here, give cake. Yeah, so I make sure that they, I just bring a cake or ask students whether we want to just go for a lunch. Yeah, even if we all pay for ourselves, but having some social activities, spoiling your students every now and then is not a bad thing. Remember, yeah, they must enjoy to come to the labs and enjoy working there. And I'm sure if they enjoy it, that you will enjoy it more. I spoke about delegation of tasks. And then importantly, if you are away from the lab, yeah, make sure that you are available. You catch up with your students. I have fixed meeting times with each and every of my students every month with a formal PowerPoint, which is scheduled in our group calendar. They know exactly when they have to come and see me and what they have to produce. So this make, ensures that they are forced to also produce updates and reports on a regular basis. Finally, I would say, make sure that you create a positive, inclusive working environment so that everybody feels welcome. Because if people do, you will certainly enjoy working in that environment as well. So I'm just going to wrap up. I've just got a few more things. Networking communication, really important. Yeah. So start early to build a network. Make use of LinkedIn, of events like these and others produced, say, by the African Academy of Sciences. When you go out, meet people, be friendly. If you've met somebody, send them an email afterwards, say thank you. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Make sure that maybe at your local institution you get involved in the seminar program. Start inviting local or national, potentially even international visitors. And as your network will grow, this will help you to also raise your own profile. I already spoke about promoting your group on the web, social media. Make sure that you apply for prizes and awards. And of course, we all at some point feel as if we are imposters, that we don't really fit, that we are not good enough. There's a very good paper in Nature about this. Don't worry, we all go through that on a regular basis. But just remember that actually, yeah, you are in a position where you have your own skills, that you have things where you can also contribute and build on that. Yeah, we will never know everything, but at the same time, you can become the, the master of the area where you are working in. And then if you really want to raise your profile, organize a conference, whether it's a national conference, might be that you can get involved at first in the international conference. I wouldn't just say that you should start in organizing international conference if you have no experience, but yeah, think about those things. And of course, public engagement is really important. So around effective collaboration, look for opportunities to find collaboration, but I would say choose your collaborators carefully. Um, there can be great reward to collaborations, but it always has an element of risk. I would look for natural overlap, look for mutually beneficial interactions, and commit carefully. You don't have to commit right from the start to, 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 to collaborate. Think about it and take your time to decide and engage. When you do engage, engage fully. Of course, collaborating with the industry is important. That could produce money and income, but that has a very different nature to it from collaborating with with academic colleagues. And on a personal note, usually my collaborators are also friends, and I find that very, very important. If I like to collaborate with somebody, usually they are my friends as well, or they turn out to become friends because yeah, there's a shared set of values and ways of thinking and doing that I think is really important. And so the last slide is investing in yourself. I think we can get so busy with running our group and looking after students and teaching and administrating and writing grants and looking for funding or looking for, for equipment and resources that we forget about ourselves. 
I would suggest that you put a little bit of time aside on a regular basis, maybe once every two weeks, yeah, an hour or two to think about your research, to plan, to make space for yourself, to maybe read, keep up with your field academically, of course, but maybe you are interested in some management or leadership books, for instance. There might be some things, some training courses at your home institution online, maybe through the African Academy of Sciences online resources. Look at things that you think will contribute to your personal development, but also to the growth and the kind of development of your own research group. Find a mentor, and not only to be mentored, but maybe also think of, at some point, maybe not immediately, to also to become a mentor. And you'll probably do that informally with your students, and I think that's a really valuable experience to reflect on what is required to be successful and make sure that you also pass those messages on to your students. And then, very importantly, work-life balance. I think we have to learn to sometimes say no, you know, not always please, and not always yes, but sometimes to say no, because our personal circumstances will change over time. It might be that you're more free at the moment, but in a year or two years' time, your circumstances will change, and that, that is not the case anymore. There's certainly no single solution that would fit all circumstances. But I think the one thing I've learned over the years is to be strict, to set a sensible time in agreement with the other family members when you want to be home, what you need to do at what times, and stick to those, and then work the other bits of your work life around that. And because we are flexible as academics, it might be that it's much easier to do that if, for instance, if you have a nine to five job where you are bound by office hours. So please keep that in mind and be creative but don't just say yes to everything sometimes yeah and i know the pressure when you start off you feel that you should say yes to everything but actually sometimes it's okay to say could i consider could i maybe think how i will fit this in because at the moment actually i've got quite a lot going on and i hope that that would give you a bit of leeway to sometimes say no for certain things so where does this all end yeah so this is a very brief overview and I know that there are many things in which I've probably only glanced over and I might not have kind of answered any of the, your questions to any level of satisfaction. But actually, I think this is the start of an exciting journey for all of you. And you should really enjoy it. You know, with all the ups and downs that come with an academic position. So the question then is where does this all end? The answer is I don't know. But all I can say is please enjoy this exciting journey to see where you end up. So I've got a few resources here, so this will be available, of course. Go speak to Grace, see what the African Academy of Sciences have in terms of resources on their website. There are other websites, so for instance, Vitae in the UK, the Welcome. Yeah, they have yeah, quite a lot of resources and tips for running your own uh, research group. Yeah. There are management books so that you might or might not want to read. Uh, some of them I've read, some I'm aware of. There are many things. Make sure that you find a mentor if you don't have one yet. Yeah. And bottom line is, this is great fun. So please enjoy. So I would like to thank Grace and her colleagues at the African Academy of Sciences and other colleagues at the Royal Society for making this work. Um, I would like to acknowledge each and every one of my students over the years, not only those on the photo year, um, but them for contributing to my success in a fantastic way. Without them, it would not have been possible. Lots of colleagues internationally, so Ian, who's now in Canada, Xi, who's in China, Natalie and Anna in Bristol, L2 in Shanghai, Anna in Berlin. Lots of people who contributed very recently, funding. And finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. I would be very happy to try and answer some questions. So, Grace, over to you. Well, uh, thanks so much, Chal. Uh, that was really uh, uh, a deep conversation on how one might set up and manage a research lab, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. I have highlighted a few things that you have talking, uh, talked about, right from starting small to getting the money and the team to investing in yourself, to developing a culture for your group. 
Now, what I will do now is I will, I'm going. I'm looking at the questions that have been submitted, and I will go through them as they came through. I will read them out so that everyone has a chance to know what questions we have, um, and then we will respond to them. So, if you have any questions, keep. I can see they they are, they are coming. So, we'll try. We'll try to respond to them as they come. So, the first question we had. Um, let me get to it again. Um, just a minute. I see there are lots of questions now. Uh, there was a question about money, and I could connect this question. There are two questions that are, might be related. There's a question from Patrick, then a question from Ami, Aminata. Uh, Patrick is asking, where can I find the money specifically for setting up and building my own lab? Uh, a question that could be related to that is from Aminata Kone. She's asking, how do you start a research group if you're starting small with a small grant that does not guarantee financial support for your students and neither does your institution support students, especially in African countries? So you could respond to those two questions together, Chal. Okay, yeah, sure. So thank you for the, for the question. So of course, uh, this is tricky. I know it might be that yeah, you have to take the time to sit and look for funding opportunities from your maybe national funding body. And I think these days there are usually quite a few opportunities for early career researchers, people starting out. There might be something like a first grant scheme or early career researcher scheme that you have to apply to. Um, it might be that you have to be creative in how you make your money go a little bit further. And this is where it becomes tricky because it might be that you have to talk to a local industry and ask them for a small bit of sponsorship so that you can maybe pay a summer student to help you set up your lab. Um, when I moved from Germany to Bristol, I actually employed the three summer students on the photo on this page in the start of my presentation. And actually, so I did not have a lot of money but they, all three of them were very hungry for some experience. And so we ended up coming to a compromise where I could pay them a little bit, but they were very, very valuable in helping me to get my lab going, uh, sorting out things, finding things, uh, learning the environment and know where to speak to, who to speak to. So you have to be a little bit creative. Yeah? And especially maybe if you don't get the kind of support that you would hope for from your home institution, but this is also where I think it's important to engage with those who are in charge, maybe your head of department or the head of the section that you are in, and ask them how you can go about in finding money, whether they have any ideas, where you and how you can find some hands in the lab. And maybe, and this is where collaboration comes in handy. You might have to join one of your senior colleagues in co-supervising a, a short-term project student. And yeah, so I think that, yeah, I unfortunately do not have a simple answer. So to summarize, maybe look at your national funding agency. Look, for instance, if you are working in the field of chemistry, for instance, the Royal Society of Chemistry have some small grants, whether it's for travel or maybe for some activities. It might be that the Royal Society has some grants that you could apply for. And please speak to other early career researchers. They might have some ideas of where you might be able to find money, whether it's within the national context or maybe within an African context. But finding money, especially at the start, is really tricky. Um, and, but the one thing where I have actually managed to kind of find some really good resources is in students who came to visit my lab for short periods of time, who came with their own support. And I've used those over the years to really help start some of my programs in my lab quite successfully because they came with their own resources and they came for a short period of time but if you can use that in a very targeted and planned way you might get to the point where you can use that to set up a new program so i hope that that answers some of the questions or at least to some extent the questions that were asked uh, thanks charles for that and i, I would suggest to the uh, listeners that you can, uh, you can register to the AES newsletter, www.aasciences.africa, where you can receive regular updates on any funding opportunities available from us and our partners. Uh, Charles, the next question is about recruiting the team. There's a question from Amin and another one from Lenin. Uh, Amin is asking, what is the best strategy for identifying 
or recruiting students with good potential. Related to that is Lenin, who is saying, thank you, very, thank you for a very informative session. You mentioned not being picky with choosing your hands in love in the beginning. But what do you look out for now, assuming you are now more picky? Yeah. Over to you, Carl. Okay. Great, thanks. No, thank you for those questions. So, yeah, so how do you identify good students? Yeah, this is, especially when you are starting, yeah, you sometimes can't be too picky, yeah, I admit, because you desperately want to get your programs going. But I think what I need to, so what is really important is to meet with the students, if at all possible, face to face, talk to them, get to know them a little bit, um, find out what their goals are, find out how ambitious they are. Um, make sure, of course, that, so for instance, if they are not local, maybe you can have a telephone or Skype meeting with them just to make sure that you don't just take whoever comes your way. So I think, um, and that way you might think, okay, that might scare off some candidates, but actually I found over the years that that actually means that those who are really interested and keen will actually engage more because they can see that you are engaging with the process of selecting students. I make sure that I get a CV, I ask for a letter of reference as well. Why this is important first and foremost to see what the students' computer capabilities are, if they are neat. Yeah, but also they'll you'll get a little bit of feedback from uh, somebody who knows them but what kind of student they are. Um, so that all of those things will probably help you to make decisions about students in your in your in, to join your group. Let's say you already have a few students and you have more students applying. Get your own students involved in this recruitment process. Maybe say, okay, guys, today I'm happy to send you with this prospective PhD student and go and have lunch. Yeah, and just talk informally. It might be that you just sponsor them for just a quick takeaway or something. But actually, that might be that that will give you valuable information from your students afterwards. Actually, how the student performs and the type of questions they ask. But I also encourage students who are applying to my lab to talk to my own students who are already in my lab. And I say, here are the email addresses of some key people in my lab. Feel free to interact with them and ask them questions. Why? Because I want the students to have the opportunity to ask some questions where I'm not involved. Um, so those are kind of a few ideas that you might or could use in your setting to try and identify the best students. Um, but of course, as you then become, your group grows and you can become more picky. I think, yeah, the question is always, the question is to find students who strive for excellence, the students who are proactive. Those students who might have already secured some of their own funding or have won some prizes in their local university, maybe as undergraduates, that is already a kind of a local indicator of success. And that really helps you to make some decisions about the type of students that you can take. So I'm not sure if I, asked or answered the questions that were raised but yes recruiting is always a tricky one because of course once you've recruited somebody and they turn out to be not such a good choice it might be that you are stuck with them for a while but actually that gives you the opportunity to provide input into their careers and hopefully you can also change your situation around like that even if it's not perfect but yeah there's always a balance between needing people and taking the very best people and that balance stays tricky. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Charles, for that. Uh, there's a question from Itai Magodoro. Um, he's asking, uh, what would you consider to be the key functions that are required for a research group? I want to believe this is more about research management. And he gives an example. A business will have marketing, finance, operations, ETC. What might be the equivalent functions for a research group? Okay, so that's an interesting question. So I would I would say, I mean, if you maybe think of what I, I, I showed in that slide um, with the three circle models, so of course, you will have a task that you want to achieve. Let's say you say, I have a, the, the aim of my research will be to, let's say, increase drinking water quality in my local area. And I think that would be one of the key functions then is to focus on the research output. With that, you have the need to build your team, their expertise, your students. 
your own expertise, raise profile, and with that is to kind of um, also focus on the, the outcome. So it's the kind of achieving the task that you want to set, you need to build your own team, make sure that they and maintain the team so that you can pursue that task. And of course, also develop the students and yourself. So what does that look like in practice? It might mean that you have to write regular papers and have good research output in terms of uh, experimental papers that you publish. Yeah, with that goes grant funding. Yeah, but at the same time, you also have to make sure that your students graduate, yeah? that you have output in terms of masters and PhD theses and students that finish, yeah? as well, of course, of being a good citizen in your own project uh, within your own department. Yeah? So there are practical things that you would have to do, but I would say if you want to compete on an international level as a researcher, people will look to clear goal, clear aims of what you want to do. Yeah prizes and things like this, not only for you, for your students, your, your team, and of course, finally, your research output in terms of papers, patents, maybe industry collaboration, money, grants, and those kind of. So I would probably try and kind of arrange it like that. So I hope that answers the question as kind of key functions of the research group. Okay, thanks, Chal. Uh, there's a question from Nicholas. He's asking, can you please elaborate more on factors that one should consider when deciding on number of projects to get involved in? How thin or wide should one stretch themselves? And I think Nicholas uh, particularly is referring to when you talked about chasing the money or chasing the project, because I'm trying yeah. to just try to get one project of another to keep yourself going as a researcher. Over yeah. to you, Chow. Okay, thank you for this question. Yes, so this is, Really difficult. So I think we have to always be mindful that, yeah, we have a limited bandwidth. It might be that you can take on two or three or four projects, but actually, if there's some practical work connected to that, you need the hands to be able to do that. And of course, you could say, yes, I have four students, so I can take on eight projects or 12 projects. Actually, you also have to be fair to your students because they finally have to achieve a coherent story that they have to produce a master's or a PhD thesis. So if you can fit it all in within the broad framework of what they have to do for their thesis work, I think it's okay to have, let's say, if you think in terms of a thesis, different chapters, which might be different projects. But actually, we also have to be careful, especially if you have younger researchers who may be just starting with a master's degree, that you don't overwhelm them with too many things to do and too many disparate tasks in different fields. So I would always caution against to do too many things um, so that actually you have the possibility to rather deliver and deliver very well on what you want to do. It might be that you see as your students grow and they mature, they might be able to take on some side projects. So for instance, very often um, there's a so-called 80-20 rule where somebody would say, some of my colleagues do this, I sometimes do this, but not usually at the start of a project where I would tell a student, okay, you've got an 80% project where you will spend 80% of your time on, and then there's a smaller side project on which I would expect you to spend 20% of your time. It will be related to their main project, but this might have a different outcome. This might be a kind of a small collaboration with industry, or might be a blue sky idea that we want to try out. But I'm always very mindful that my students need to produce a thesis which is coherent at the end of their time and I don't want to put them in a difficult situation where they've worked for me on a number of different projects but don't have the required output that they need to be to be successful. So I hope that that answers that in some way. Thanks, Chal. Um... Okay, any further questions? Yes, Chal. Actually, we do have more than five questions and we are just top of the hour. So I hope you, if you have five extra minutes, we'll try yeah. to run through the remaining no, questions. I, I definitely have, so I'm very happy to try and answer some more. Okay, so let's try and answer a few more questions. And for, the, for those who have asked questions, if you stay on for a few more minutes, you'll be able to get answers to your questions. So I'll still try and merge some of them. So if you don't hear your question being read out, it means it has been answered in one of the other questions. Um, over to you, Charles. Can you recommend a project-related software, tried and tested, particularly useful for keeping tabs 
on your student project progress and to do's for both you and them? That's a question from Lenin. Okay, so yeah, that is a, a good question. So I've kind of shied away from using kind of project management software. So for the very simple reason that I'm concerned that because I might not be such a proficient user that I might end up spending more time trying to work the, 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 the software rather than focusing on the science. But saying that, I've just used some, let's say, very old fashioned tools of being very organized. So I mentioned before, I meet with each and every one of my students formally every month. We have a set time, they have a set format of what they should prepare for the meeting. And we then meet whether I am in Bristol or whether I sit in China or in Nairobi or in Karakpur in India, doesn't matter. We should still meet. And they should send me a PowerPoint beforehand with all the required information. And we use that as a basis for discussion. And these PowerPoints usually start off with the overall aim and objectives of their project. And I ask them to reflect what they've done in the last four weeks. I ask them to have some slides on what they are busy doing now. And their PowerPoint has to end off with what they are planning for the next four weeks. And in that way, we use that as a project planning tool to keep on track. They know exactly where they are going as an overall project, but they also keep track of the, the details on a kind of a weekly and then a monthly basis. And what I find very useful for this approach, which doesn't make use of formal software, I must admit, yeah, is that my students keep on generating electronic content. So whether that is figures of structures or kind of schemes or um, written up work or already kind of discussed uh, spectra, but they have everything in electronic format which they can use directly in their thesis. I know that there are people, so one of my colleagues is a big uh, fan of using Trello, which kind of makes use of boards around projects. And some people find that very helpful. I would suggest that you look at the options out there. I mean, you could just go to, so Microsoft has a kind of a project management software. Trello is an online resource. There are many others, um, but I've so far shied away from those because I have something which I've, I think works for me works for my students not only for the project but also generating content for the for their final masters or phd thesis and that seemed to have worked quite well for me to date yeah but if you have a new and kind of groundbreaking software that you think will work i would be very happy to hear about that as well of course thank you chal uh, so yeah if anyone has also uh, sort of uh, resources would like to share, feel free to drop them on the chat box as well. I realize the questions keep on increasing, so we may not be able to cover all of them. I, I suggest we go up to for the next 10 minutes, and after that, we are going to stop. And then, any questions that Charles won't have responded to, I'll be able to connect you via email because when you said your email, uh, your question, I, do, I can see your name and I'll have your email address on your registration form. Uh, let's take something that maybe Chal didn't talk about today. Uh, Chal, there's a question. Uh, when you are in the beginning of your career, sometimes you're not able to answer all the questions from your team members during meetings. Yeah. How do you handle these situations without losing credibility towards your team? That's from Yasmin. Okay, so Yasmin, that's a, that's a very good question because of course, yeah, your students look up to you and they expect you to know and we of course want to make sure that we can answer the questions but this is where also a little bit of this imposter syndrome comes in because if they ask a question that you don't know the first thing you think is oh maybe i should not be here maybe i don't i'm not the suitable person to run a group actually the 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 the, the kind of strategy i've taken over the years is if i really don't know <clears throat> is to be honest and say to the student <clears throat> Sorry, to say to the student, actually, I'm not 100% sure how to answer this. Or, you know, I need to go and think to come up with a sensible answer. But I'll get back to you, let's say, next week. And that gives me the chance to be honest to say I don't have an answer now. Gives me the opportunity to go away and think and maybe look at other resources. But I think importantly, you need to then really go back to the student and answer the question that they raised. If you just use that as a way out not to answer questions, students will very quickly know this. So you need to say, actually, maybe at next group meeting next week on Monday, 
please remind me so that I answer your question and then you need to go away and think and find an answer to that. And it might be that you know the answer, but actually maybe at that moment you just couldn't remember, you couldn't think of the answer. Yeah. It might be that you have to go and do a bit of reading and say, actually, that was really interesting. I never thought of this. Here's a potential answer or here's a potential solution to that point you raised. And that might have a positive impact not only on the kind of your students and how they see you, but might even have a positive impact on your research. So I would be honest, but I would also kind of make sure that I get back to them with an answer so that they know that actually you are in a position where you can go and find the answers and address the questions that they raise. So I hope that that helps. Okay. Thanks, Charles. Um, I'll, I'll take a question from Agnes. Um, she, uh, and this is a little bit different from setting up and managing a research lab, but she'd like to know how easy it is to focus your career in a different direction from your PhD focus. Okay. So, yeah. So I think probably this is a, a, a kind of a, a tricky one. Yeah. So I have looked at some of my colleagues over the years. We've managed to change direction quite dramatically, yeah, and some do it very successfully. Um, I have taken a slightly different approach, yeah. So I've slowly grown my profile, and maybe only in the last four or five years, where I started to branch out into other areas. Yeah, in the last five years, so I tried to first focus and build a profile in the area that I was comfortable with. And then why? Because, of course, you have the correct background, you have the correct knowledge, you can really start your, your career or your, your, your kind of independent output on, kind of, let's say, maybe faster. But if you are really set on changing your, 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 your area, I would suggest that this is maybe where a second postdoc would come in handy. So you go and find the practical experience and work in a lab in the area that the new area that you're interested in so that you don't end up in your own group and you have to really start from absolute scratch and with of course the danger of reinventing the wheel so if you have that possibility and you're really very keen to change your field i would suggest that you do it in a targeted way maybe find a postdoc position or a research kind of stay or research fellowship to go and visit a lab that you know is already working in the area that you want to work in learn from them and that might of course also lead to some longer term collaborations but it's something that i would suggest that if you want to do that that you do that in a very careful and planned fashion otherwise you might end up not producing and not producing the output that you would be keen to do as an early career researcher and that might end up you doing all the things that you don't want to do rather than focus on the research that you want to do so i i hope that answers so there's no I would say, yeah, if you do that, that's okay to do, but you have to do it in a very specific and targeted fashion to ensure that you have a high degree or that there's a high potential and the chance for success. Okay. Thanks, Chal. Uh, there's a question uh, from Pauline. She's asking about what to do when you're in between grants. Uh, what is the productive and creative way of, of growing your career while you don't have a grant and maybe are waiting for another? Yeah, so I, I would say that is a difficult time. Yeah? And this is where I think it's really helpful to talk, for instance, to your head of department, make sure that they are aware that you are now in between grants, that you are busy writing or have already submitted the next ones, you share your plans with them. And then, of course, maybe that will give you, put you in a position where you can ask for a little bit of bridging support or even just a bit of kind of support in terms of helping you to move faster or maybe make you aware of other opportunities. Um, practically on the day-to-day -day stuff, yeah, of course, it might be that you have to kind of make do with a little bit less in terms of your activity, or you, you might have to focus your science in a slightly different way. So, for instance, there was a time when I needed some really expensive equipment. I did not have the money to buy that. So I changed my focus on my research slightly to focus more on synthetic work, which I had all the chemicals, I had all the infrastructure to do that. And actually that then kind of meant that I had a slight refocus, but that actually carried me through some lean times. And so, and that actually changed in the long term, the direction of my activities quite a bit. But that came from the fact that actually I was in between 
funding and I had to make a decision on how to deal with that. But I think uh, not having funding doesn't mean that everything comes to a standstill. Yeah? I think you just have to carefully try and plan ahead so that if you know that there will be a period coming where you might be without funding, that you try and get some grants in before that time and that you keep track of where things are in terms of your own finances. And this comes back to the point I made before to talk also to your finance people and make sure that you keep track of spending in your grants and that you keep track of where you are in the cycle so that you apply at the right time. Yeah. And once again, if you have good students, you can, of course, encourage them to apply for their own funding, maybe from a national funding body and that might relieve some of the pressure and so that they come with their own funding and help to carry things in the lab in a slightly different way. So we have to be sometimes innovative and in finding different sources of, of and different pots of money to keep the research going. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, finally, there's a question about PIS senior researchers. Um, and I, I will read one of them, and I hope you, once you respond to that, it'll have to most of the other questions. Um, let me okay. see which one best explains the details. Um, so the, let me read this one. Um, for publication, how do you deal with corresponding other issue? For some discipline, it is obvious that it is the PI, and for some other, it is the student or researcher who performed most of the study. There is a related question, I'm trying to look at where it has gone, which was asking about senior scientists in your department uh, who expect you to, to follow on their research agenda rather than develop your own. How do you manage that when you want to set up your own team while you have a supervisor or someone you're directly reporting to that requires you to align with their research agenda? Okay, so Yes, I think yeah, very valid questions because yeah, this can be sometimes tricky. Um, so I'll address the first one concerning corresponding author. So the rule I can share the rule that I have in my labs, which I think works really well. So, for instance, the student who does the 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 lion's share of the work, the majority of the work in a study, will be the first author. I will be, because it's the, the, the project area and the subject area and the focus area of my overall research group, will be the corresponding author. I don't want to be the first author because I want students who have done the work to have the ability to show off and showcase their, their work. So usually I go right at the end and so and I will be the corresponding author. If I have a joint student, and the joint student is the one who did the most of the work, then both my colleague and I will be corresponding authors at the end of the authors list. And the student who did most of the work will be the first author. If there are several students who have contributed, I think, for instance, I've had systems where one student was their main project, but they could not have done the project without the input of two other three students. The main student goes to the first author, and then the other go after that. If somebody made a tiny contribution, I would be very happy to acknowledge them at the end of the paper. But a tiny contribution does not equate, in my case, yeah, inclusion as an author on a paper. Of course, it might be that in your institution, yeah, there's a requirement from whether it's the head of the department or a senior person that they are always included on a paper and that they are always the, the corresponding author. Um, yeah, that can be really tricky. I think the way to do that is to engage in discussion. Of course, if you are fully dependent on them for money or for resources or for students or for equipment, I would say then go for a compromise and have joint corresponding authors, both this person and you. And or otherwise just have this discussion and see and try and explain that you are really trying to create your own independent profile which will be of benefit to your department so if you are successful as a young independent researcher they will benefit in the long run and therefore yeah you would like to see what the opportunities are for you to also be the sole corresponding author but there's no right or wrong or they say that this will take some negotiation in certain institutions in certain situations um, of course if they are senior scientists who you are dependent on and you are collaborating with of course they should be on your papers 
if they expect you to be just adding their names to papers but they are not contributing, I would still ask for their input. I would send them the manuscript and please ask for their input. And of course, as your group grows and as your resources grow, it might be then easier to become more independent. But I mean, this is really hard because I know that sometimes this can be very tricky and that especially young researchers will suffer. But I think that's one thing that you guys have to remember at the start of your career. Please remember this when you become senior, that when you have young career, early career researchers starting in your department, that you give them all the support and the ability to become independent in such a way that you don't hold them back and that you provide support and be kind and generous with your time and your your advice without the expectation that you would always get something from them. And of course, if you really collaborate with somebody, it's perfectly fine. But sometimes it's also okay to to try and support somebody and yeah, give them the ability to become independent. But I know this can be really tricky, especially in situations which are very hierarchical. And I would encourage you to engage thoughtfully and carefully and politely but with good reason why you should have the opportunity to become independent and really be, uh, uh, let's say, a highlight and a star researcher for your department. And hopefully that will enable you to become more independent as you go along. So I hope that that has answered those questions, but I think, yeah, that's not necessarily an easy one to answer. Uh, thanks so much, Chell, and I love that you have touched on man uh, time management in your last part of, uh, of your answer because there are several questions about time management, several questions about the number of postdocs or students one should take up uh, uh, and, and how to deal with that. So you can say maybe a few things to close this webinar. What I would recommend is that you and I will talk and see if we can plan a second webinar where we'll start by responding to the questions that we currently have, which you haven't exhausted, and then we'll perhaps take more questions. So what you could you could give us your remarks and maybe talk about your own time management. How how do you ensure work life balance, especially when you have to stay away from your family to to write grants or to write reports? of those grants. Maybe you can touch on that and then close uh, close your session of the webinar, yeah. Okay, so I think time management, the one thing that I've learned is that I have to be exceptionally efficient when I am at work. Of course, it's important to talk. It's important to interact with colleagues. I'm not saying don't do that, but actually to mm -hmm. stick to a routine where you have the ability to close your door if you have your own office or put some headphones on if you're in a shared space and focus and be really very, very productive. I have a long kind of, I have a constant to-do list, which I update where I manage things for students and teaching activity. My duties as head of the section where I manage 17 staff members and all the teaching and all the other aspects of what they do. I have my own research group, which at the moment is 24 people, which I have to manage and then, of course, my personal life. So every day I sit down, I have a piece of paper. This is very, let's say, very low tech. But on the piece of paper, I draw four. I just kind of divide the piece of paper into four quarters and one for each of those areas. And I make a list of the things I need to do. And I sit and I start working and crossing things off my list. And if I come to the end of my day, I pack my things up and I leave. And this has been quite hard for me in the last year, year and a half, where I've tried to be far more disciplined. So I've made an agreement with Jacqueline, my wife, what time I will leave the office. I pack my things up and I go. Whether my work is done or not, I go. Why? Because the work will be there tomorrow or very often late in the evening when things have settled down and I have the time I might go back and look at something or very often I get up very early in the morning when it's quiet and I do something. So I think it's important to set some kind of routine so that you not only manage your time in your, in your work environment, but that kind of spills over in managing your time also for your family and for your family. And it's not easy, I know. I don't have this fully under control. I'll be the first person to, to admit that. But actually, the more I focus on trying to be as efficient as possible at work, actually, this really helps me to not waste my time by you know, checking my phone or websites or news or 
having another coffee or so, all those things are good things and it might be that you enjoy taking lunch but have to be focused and kind of have a very fixed time for lunch and not sit for a little bit longer all those things add up over the day to give you a little bit of extra time to do that a little bit more to free you up to do other things which are important and as i say i'm very organized i have my own calendar i have a group calendar there's a rota for each duty in my laboratory i keep up and catch up with my students on a very regular basis i have time aside for planning every two weeks i set time aside to catch up with jacqueline where we just plan on a regular basis that might sound sound very scientific and not kind of a relationship oriented at all but we found that actually if we do that actually it really helps to keep things running smoothly so i hope that these things have been helpful not only what i've kind of tried to say in the beginning of my my presentation but also in the questions i hope i've answered but if not i apologize and i would encourage you to engage send your questions in and grace and i will see how we can you know, wrap those up and maybe launch another seminar another webinar and i would only encourage you guys to enjoy the time that you are in despite the challenges but please engage with the resources that are available to help you and i would be very happy to support you in whichever way i can with the help of grace and the african academy of sciences i can only wish you all the very best of success i look forward to seeing some fantastic science coming from all of your research groups and feel free if you publish a nice paper or something let me know feel free to send me a copy i would love to see that and love to celebrate with you okay thank you very much thank you very much uh child we highly appreciate your very informative session and answering those questions there are many more actually i have over 15 questions that we haven't responded to so we'll we'll, we'll see how we can best do this we've exited by almost an extra 30 minutes, we've already at 25 minutes. So thank you everyone for joining. We had a very good turnout for this. Three quarters of those who registered to attend actually did attend this webinar and we are glad that that happened. Uh, so this webinar has been recorded and so you'll be able to get a link to this uh, video and audio later on. And I'll also ask Charles to share the slides with us so that you may refer to them whenever you need them. So thank you very much everyone and look forward to the next uh, our next communication on how we respond to the questions that we are not able to respond to today. Uh, goodbye from Nairobi.